Um, but I am glad to be here with you. I'm just going to assume that if I try to be funny that you're smiling and laughing under your mask, okay? Can we just agree that when I try to, that you do it, okay, cool? All right. Um, today we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and take your Bible out, um, your phone, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to live between verses 13 and 25. 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 25. Uh, but I want to start off by asking you a question. Um, how many of you in your life have ever been in a situation where you were given an impossible standard to live up to? Okay? Maybe when you were growing up, you had some, a parent, a family member who, who put an expectation on you that you just thought, man, I can never live up to that. You know, the Last Dance documentary about Michael Jordan and the Bulls here recently, um, super popular. We, we were talking a ton on the live stream uh, about it. I thought, what would it be like to be Michael Jordan's kids, <laughs> right? It was like, this whole documentary is about how great he is. He's the greatest player. Look at him. He's just, he's such a competitor. He does all this so good. And I'm thinking, poor Michael Jordan's kids. <laughs> they, have, they have quite the standard to live up to because their whole childhood was revolved around, are you going to be the next dad, your dad, right? Are you going to be the greatest player? What a standard to have to live up to. Maybe you've been at work before, and a project, a task, a department has come across your plate, and it was maybe an enormous amount of work where it really should have been two people, right? But you're expected by yourself to accomplish the task, it felt like an impossible standard. Maybe you've been at work before and you were given a, a task and you didn't have the resources, you were not equipped well enough to handle what you were being asked to handle, right? And so the standard that was given to you felt like it was impossible to live up to because you weren't in a place to do it the way that it needed to be done. I have to be very careful as a parent, as a dad, not to do this. I'm an achiever by nature. I like to get things done I like to check off to-do lists. I want to accomplish things. But if I'm not careful, I can put impossible standards on my kids and expect them to live up to some standard that I've come up with myself. It happens all the time when, uh, when it, my son Judah is playing sports. I have to be very careful because we go out and we're practicing baseball, and, and I'm acting like he's the next Babe Ruth, Mike Trout, you know, who, Derek Jeter, whatever era of baseball you like. Like he's the next one. And thankfully, I have friends in my life. My dad corrects me. Uh, my buddy, Matt Whitson, just the other day, Wayne Jones, they always ask me the same question. Is he having fun? <laughs> Is he having fun? What are they getting at? Hey, be careful to set an impossible standard for your son playing baseball that it ruins him even wanting to play baseball, right? And we're looking at a passage today that when I come across it reading the Bible, it feels a little bit like that. If we look at verse 15, which is kind of the synopsis of what we're going to be reading today, 1 Peter 1, 15 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And we can read that, and we can just breeze right past it. Or we can read that and maybe get a little discouraged. Because let's think about what it's really asking. God, perfect in holiness, perfect in purity, perfect in wisdom, perfect in all ways, one of them being holiness, says, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus, guess what? Be holy like I'm holy. There are angels in heaven who just sing holy, holy, holy all the time. That's how holy God is. And he's asking us to be holy like that. What an, what a, an impossible standard that God is asking us to live up to. And I read that and I can get a little discouraged because I'm an achiever. I want to do things. Like when he says, be holy, like I'm holy, I'm like, I want to do it. And I'm like, God, you know everything about me. You know where I struggle. You know that I'm weak. And so if you get discouraged reading this, path, this, uh, this passage today, I want you to know this. Is that your holiness, it's not dependent on you. It's not dependent on how good you are, how strong you can be, how much you can force holiness in your life. Your holiness is dependent on God working through you, through his Holy Spirit, and he will empower you to be holy. And the longer you walk with God, the longer you are in his word, you become more and more like him, more and more holy as he is holy. 
what I want today to be about, more than being discouraged maybe that we don't measure up, I want it to be an opportunity to look at some areas in our lives that we'll see in this passage and allow the Holy Spirit to maybe expose some areas that God would like to bring more holiness into. Like maybe there's something in my life that, I, that is unseen that I just haven't dealt with. Maybe there's something in my life I don't want to deal with that I've been putting kind of on the back burner. And the Holy Spirit wants to illuminate, hey, this is an area of life where I want to see, I want to, I want to help you be a little more holy. You with me? I can't hear you, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but if we're being honest, holiness in our world today can, can be a little difficult, right? There, there are a few reasons for this. There, there are two that I see that are most glaring. One is that we live in a culture and a society today that, that is void of truth. A lot of people in society today would say that your truth can be your truth and, and my truth is my truth, but your truth can't step on my truth and vice versa. Okay, you live your own truth. So as followers of Jesus, we come in and say, hey, me and you and, and all of us, guess what? We have a standard of holiness to live by. And we walk around in a society that says there is no such thing as standards. And so it can be difficult to have this standard of holiness because our society does not value truth. The other reason it can be very difficult is because the, the fact, the reality for a believer, we've been talking about this, um, Pastor Brandon has been on some of our live stuff over the past month, is that earth is not your home. Like, like this is not home for us. We're, we're exiles here. That's why I love the Old Testament. It stinks for them to be exiled the whole time. Sorry that they had to go through that, but it's a really good opportunity for us to live, to learn how to live here on earth because they were exiled, and guess what? So are you. You're a citizen of heaven if you're a follower of Jesus. We're longing to go home one day. So just by nature of not being from here, things don't match up with the way that we want to live life. How many of you know there's people in your life that they be testing your holiness? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like they make you want to get a little unholy sometimes, right? If you're a parent, listen. You get your holiness tested. I get mine tested every single day. <laughs> We're not from here. And so we, we rub against culture. However, and if you don't get anything, please listen to this. Do not lower your standards that God has set to fit into a world and, there, and therefore settle for less than what God has for you. Do not lower your, your standard and settle for less than what God wants in your life. God has put it there for a reason because he created you and he knows what's best. And so don't settle for less than what he's created for you. Let's define what holiness is. So, so hopefully we're on the same page that holiness is, is a thing that we need as a follower of Jesus. Let's talk about what it is. I want to give you two definitions that I believe give a, a real nice picture of what holiness can be for you and I. The first one is that it simply means different. It means to be different. I remember when I was in high school, I don't know if you were like this, that was the last thing I wanted to be. <laughs> like the last thing I wanted in school was to be different. I was trying to fit in. I was trying to fly under the radar, right? Like I, I'm just trying to, I don't want to get, I don't want nobody to mess with me. I don't want to be made fun of. Like I'm just trying to slide through this thing. I, I wore this, uh, Y'all remember when band t-shirts were really cool? I don't, maybe they still are, I don't know. I used to wear like band t-shirts back in the day. Uh, I had this uh, pop punk band t-shirt on one day. Kids started making fun of me. I never wore it back to school again. Because <laughs> why? I was different. Hey, no, I don't want any part of that. I'm sliding in here. I just want to blend in. For the life of the Christian, the follower of Jesus, that's not an option. We're called to be holy, which means that we're called to be different. That does not mean we have to be weird and odd and strange. It does mean we shouldn't look identical to the world. We shouldn't look the same as the world. We shouldn't even look like we did before we followed Jesus. Right? We, we should look different from our old self. The, the Bible tells us that the old has passed and the new has come. That if we're a new creation in Christ, we should look different than our past and we should look different than un, the unbelieving world around us. The second definition is to be set apart. So to be different has more about the character of holiness. To be set apart really gets at the purpose of holiness. See, when you're set apart, you have a calling and a, and a purpose and a, and a reason to be here. 
I, I love this definition uh, when it comes to the purpose of holiness. It says, God in his holiness desires a holy people amongst whom he can dwell, who can, this is so beautiful, who can effectively worship, witness to, and serve him as they prepare for a future with God and to be like God. See, the purpose of you being set apart is what it says, to effectively worship, witness to, and serve him. And it makes this distinction here because it's really easy when you think about holiness just to think about right behavior. Like, I'm just going to do a lot of good things and then God will value me. It'll be more love because I did a lot of things for God. Certainly, right behavior comes from holiness, but it is not the purpose of holiness. When it comes to you and I being holy, guess who it's all about? God. It's all about bringing glory to God through my life. It's, it's all about being a witness to other people when they see the love of God in my life, when they see the power of God at work, bringing me more into the image of him. It's a witness to the people around me. If you're a follower of Jesus, let me tell you this, that holiness, it constantly brings us back to the fear of the Lord. Because we recognize the vast difference between God and myself, and it makes me, it just gives me this wonder and this awe for how good God is. It also constantly brings me back to his word, where I seek truth for the Holy Spirit to show me things about how I can become more and more like him. See, our holiness is not dependent on us and is solely for God's glory and for God's kingdom. And so what I want to talk about are three areas that we're going to look at and see what standard did Jesus Christ set in these areas for us to be able to measure ourselves up to, okay? So we're going to look at the standard and what God's word says about it. The first one is that holiness sets my mind above. Holiness sets my mind above. If we back up a couple verses from um, 1 Peter 15, we're going to be in verse 13. We're going to start, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That if we want to prepare for this, this holiness in our life, we got to prepare our minds first. We have to be sober-minded. I don't know if you're like me. I have like the, I like have ADD mind. Anybody like that where it's just like, constantly going everywhere all the time, 100 miles an hour. Like, if I, I cannot stop thinking about all kinds of different things. Um, these meditation people, they call it like monkey mind, right? I think that's such a great example. It's just like all these thoughts are swinging through my head all of the time. And it really affects me when I'm trying to sit down to study the word. Like, if I'm going to get my quiet time in the morning, I sit down and I start reading, and I'm reading through the passage, yet I'm thinking about my laundry right? Like, I'm thinking about what I got to do that day. I'm thinking about I smarted off to Megan the day before. <laughs> I need to figure out how to make that right again. And, and I'm thinking about Judah's baseball practice. And I have all of these things like swinging through my head constantly. And I think in life, if we're not careful, we can have unholy thoughts swinging through our mind and we're not even perceptive of them. Like it's just happening because they're going so fast and we're not catching it and taking hold of it and taking it captive that they're swinging through our heads and maybe we don't even see it coming. A.W. Tozer gives such a great test for this that is so easy for you and I to do. He says this, what we think about when we are free to think about whatever we will. It's kind of a tongue twister. What he's saying is when you sit down after a long day at work and you don't have to think about anything, he's talking about that moment. That is who we are or will soon become. Your test today, you're going to go home and take a Sunday nap, right? Right before you take your Sunday nap, you're going to sit down and you don't have to think about anything. What are you thinking about? Are we thinking about holy things? Are we thinking about worldly things? Am I concerned about what's going on in life? Do I have something that I'm holding in my mind? It could be an addiction. It could be a lustful thought. It, it could be uh, some, some selfish. I could just be thinking about myself, right? Or do I sit down and I think about the kingdom? I think about what God is doing. I think about his son. Another way to put it is outlook determines outcome. Attitude determines action. And when I, my thoughts are having a huge impact in life. What do I think about when I don't have to think about anything? And we see that Jesus Christ, who is perfect in every way, we see what he did in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. 
It says, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Right? If Christ is there, then guess where his thoughts are? They're up there too. <laughs> his thoughts are above. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Isaiah 55 would tell us that God's ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, right? And so if I want to set my mind, if I want to operate in holiness, I need to set my mind on things that are above. Thankfully, Paul would give us an example of what that looks like in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. When it comes to your thought life, I mean, what, do you, what do you think about when you're free to think about anything? The second thing is that holiness chooses obedience. Holiness chooses obedience. Next verse, 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. He's talking about that our holiness is dependent on this decision that we're going to make to either be obedient children or to conform to the evil desires that we once had. It's a choice. Am I going to obey the things that God has told me, has shown me to do or not, right? And if you're a parent, you know this all too well because you've had that moment with your kids where you're sitting there and you tell them to do something and it, it goes so slow, you can see the wheels turning, right? <laughs> like You can see it happening in their head whether they're going to do it or not. It happened this morning. I had like a, here's the one thing you never want to hear is when your four-year-old walks in and says that they just uh, cleared out the nose of like your nine-month-old. <laughs> okay, so like, like I walk downstairs, she's like, she's like, hey, I just cleaned out Corley's nose. And I'm like, no, please don't. Like, you know, you have to have weird conversations. We don't put things in Corley's nose and her ears and her mouth. You know, it's like random conversations I never thought I would have. But I told her, like, hey, we don't do that. She's like, yes, I do. Like, hey, wait a second. No, no, you don't, even, you don't even know what you're doing. Yes, I do. You don't even have the whole thing. She, like, only had part of the thing to, like, clean out. And I was like, oh, I, I, I know how to do it, right? And so I tell her, go put it up. And she's sitting there thinking. She's like, okay. And she ends up putting the little thing down. Too often, I think, in my own life for sure, I found myself sitting there thinking, what am I going to, am I going to obey God in this situation or am I not? And I, and I want to be strong here because we need to get to a point in our holy witness where that is not an option. Look what it, Tozer said this. I read this, I was reading this series of like devotionals with Tozer and they all applied to this week. I couldn't believe it. It was really strange. It says, the act of committal to Christ in salvation, it releases the believing man from the penalty of sin. Okay, I just want to pause there and tell you that like when you hear that, that should bring some joy, like that should bring some worship and some praise inside of you, that God removed the penalty of sin for those who believe in faith on his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a beautiful truth, a beautiful reality. But he goes on to say this, but it does not release him from the obligation to obey the words of Christ. The penalty of sin has been removed. The obligation of obedience to the words of Jesus Christ has not and as we get more and more holy, as we, as we operate in the holiness that God works inside of our lives, we get to the point where we never refuse, where we, where we just say yes. It's almost like when Peter gets called, right? He says, come follow me. And he says he dropped his nets immediately. Like there was no hesitation. He said, I just dropped my nets immediately, and he did it. And that's what we're trying to cultivate in our lives when it comes to obedience. We see that Jesus, he had this perfect relationship with the Father, and it resulted in perfect obedience to his will. In John 14, 31, it says, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And then he said, rise, let us go from here. It was his love for the Father that led him to do everything that God had asked him to do. If you back up just a few verses, in 14, 15, John 14, 15, it says, he flips it on us. <laughs> he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So my question for you is this, is what does your connection to the Father look like right now? H have you allowed social distancing to cause spiritual distance in your life? Because the Bible tells us in John 15, apart from me, you can do 
nothing. And so if we want to be fruitful for the kingdom, if we want to walk in obedience to what God has called us to do, it has everything to do with us being connected to him, spending time with him in the word, prayer, worship. Zoom call, small groups for now. (laughs) It has everything to do with our connection to him. And we're going to do the last one very quickly, but uh, number three, holiness sacrifices for others. Holiness it sacrifices for other people. 1 Peter 1, 22 says, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, okay? So that's what we just come out of, right? We just talked about obedience. That first I prepare my mind, I go into obedient action. Now what does he say? I'm obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, loving one another deeply from the heart. If you've ever been in a close relationship, if you're married, if you've had best friends, if you've had discipled people and you've been really close, you know that, that loving other people, it, it costs you. It, it costs you something. You have to give up something to love people well. And we see this in the example of Jesus Christ. I want to read this to you from Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who, speaking of Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God loved you so much, he humbled himself to be a servant on your behalf, on my behalf, and he died on the cross, as we talked about earlier, removing the penalty of sin for those who will place their faith in Jesus Christ. Ultimate holiness in Jesus Christ led him to sacrifice on behalf of others, to to obey the will of God and sacrifice for you and I. And can I just tell you something? No more in in, in my life time have I ever seen a time where the world needs to see the love of Jesus Christ than right now. There is a lot of division and a lot of disunity in our world today, and you have the opportunity to be holy as God is holy and to show the love of Christ to other people because you've been set apart, because you have purpose every single day. Jesus Christ gave everything. How can we not return everything back to him in response? I just want to pray for you, and then we're going to worship.